recording now. So my name is uh, Jeff Kitts. I'm the Assistant Executive Director with the Saskatchewan High School's Athletic Association. I am also a basketball official, and so I, I officiate in Moose Jaw and around Moose Jaw. Uh, helping me today is Tessa Jordan. Tessa is from Winyard and uh, has vast experience in many sports, including volleyball and basketball. And Tessa is the Horizon Central District Officials Commissioner. And also blessing us with his presence today is, is Ken Parker from Unity. And Ken is our board member who is the officials representative. So, um, and then I also took a look at the list and we have a few other district official commissioners. So thank you for, for finding time. And also I just wanna thank our district official commissioners for doing what you do and ensuring we have officials at our games. So our outline today, um, this is a, an introduction to officiating basketball that I've also kind of blended to fit with the amount of teams that registered as well. So we're going to go through basketball as we kind of know it. Uh, some will be directed exactly to our officials and others will be for some of you that are here just trying to learn the game a little bit better. Um, I've tried to put together this PowerPoint based on some of the things that I've seen in the last few weeks while officiating, uh, up to and including last night. I've got a few stories from that. Uh, just some meeting norms. We want to keep our mics muted at all time. Uh, the chat is going to be monitored by Tessa. So if you do have questions, ask those. Uh, and then I've got a few polls. I've got five uh, exam questions that were on the Canadian basketball exam this year. I chose a few of the easier ones. So throughout the clinic, I'm going to put up some polls, uh, hoping that you'll take part and, and they're yes or no questions, and then we'll, we'll talk about them after. Um, and then lots of information is going to come throughout the PowerPoint. So there may be times where you're asking questions and, and maybe we ignore it, and we might ignore that question because we're going to get to it. Um, there may be times where we don't 100% know the answer. We'll find that answer for you after the fact. So I'm not, I'm not a rules expert. I didn't build the 120 page rule book, but I, I do, uh, I hope that I can answer most of the questions and, and that we can get you through there. So just to give you an idea, we'll kind of go through the team competition and what that looks like to get it going. Uh, then we'll get into the game, the warm up into the start of the game and then we'll talk about violations and, and fouls and throughout the slides you'll see lots of uh, mechanics and signals so hopefully that'll that'll help out <clears throat> so kind of two parts here um the officials uniform so when i think of the officials uniform there's there's two of those so when i used to ref with elementary basketball and moose jaw the high school students that i worked with would come wearing a t-shirt their basketball shorts and their shoes and that was perfect that's what they needed we needed people that were willing to blow a whistle and and be there willing to work hard so if you're a high school student you want to do some refing this year at the the junior level or maybe at the elementary level um i'm not telling you you need to go out and get get a uniform uh so you need a whistle you you cannot officiate a game without a whistle um a t-shirt so don't don't show up in a basketball uniform to referee a basketball game you you don't you don't want to blend in you you want to be able to kind of stand out as a person that's not playing not one of the 10 so t-shirt gray or black is is pretty standard some shorts and some court shoes just wear your basketball shoes if you're interested in continuing officiating you're moving away from university you want to do this the other side is is what we wear so we would have our gray and black officials jersey black pants black shoes black socks and most have what we call a sideline jacket <clears throat> I actually found a picture on Google of Phil Giebert. He's our officials rep from West Central out in Keniston. So team composition, this is kind of for our officials, but this is the SHSA amendment to the rules. So any teams out there and coaches, this is something you need to know that each team may dress 14 players. So we're going to have 14 players dressed. If you're going to a tournament, you can rotate those players uh, but you can't have more than 14. Maximum number of non-playing personnel allowed on the bench is four. And that's an amendment because the rule book allows a million because they'll have trainers and they have statisticians and they have a doctor. So high school level is four. We, uh, we don't have room for more than that. 
the SHSA also has a policy about headwear. And so that's not allowed on the sidelines. So coaches and uh, non-playing per personnel can't wear hats. Um, the home team is designated to wear light colored uniforms. Now we also, we realize that some teams only have one or whatever that might be. Um, so the designated home team will be expected to change in the event of color conflict. But you, if you know who you're playing, typically you know what colors they are. Um, and then the visiting team would wear dark. And the last thing, which is a, a FIBA rule, is that jerseys must be tucked in. So there obviously are times I was reffing last night, and this this guy had the the shortest jersey ever. So it what it it was tucked in for a second, and it came untucked all the time. So we, we weren't too worried about it, but. Um, the jersey should start the game tucked in, um, and if, if they're coming untucked, the officials are going to kind of give you a warning, hey, let's get that jersey tucked in, and don't give them grief. That's, that's just part of the rules. One important thing that we want to note here is that the SHSA did not or does not follow the FIBA rule regarding shoes, so the left and right shoe are not required to match. So if you went and you spent $290 on some fancy shoes that are green on the left foot and pink on the right, you're okay. We, we are not overly worried about shoes. And, and so we're good there. Um, so a major thing that does come up all the time is undergarments. And, and the reason people are confused is because it's changed every year for the last five years. So what you need to know is all players on the team must have their armor, undergarments of the same color. So if you're what if you're a t-shirt person or you are a uh, long um, leggings person or you've got an elbow elbow pad, just make sure it's all the same color. So if if you can coordinate at the start of the year, hey, we're always going to wear white or we're always going to wear black. That helps everyone with any kind of planning they're doing, anything they're purchasing. Um, you can wear white with your dark uniforms, and you can wear white undergarments with your your light just as long as everything is the same. You used to not be allowed to wear leggings. You can now wear compression leggings of, of any length. There was a time where you had to roll them up above your knee. That was ridiculous. And so they, they realized they don't need that. And then new this year is you can't wear a long sleeve loose fitting shirt, but you can wear a long sleeve compression shirt. And so that is new this year. Uh, not allowed there. You can kind of see the bandanas or anything tied players going to foul, catching that, catching the Jersey. So you can wear a headband, but you can't have anything tied or anything that's dangling behind. We're not going to go through this. I, I just wanted to pop it on the screen as this is from the rule book because we could sit here and talk for 10 minutes about what's allowed, what's not allowed. So teams, officials, players that are in this right now, if you have, if you're wondering about anything, you can jump onto the FIBA rule book and this is the breakdown it will give you. So if you've got a, a broken finger, what can I do? How can I continue to play? What am I allowed to wear? What am I not allowed to wear? It's all there. Uh, one that comes up often is knee braces and, and you can, you can wear knee braces. Um, <clears throat> so that is on the FIBA rule book. So the next part I want to get into is, is the score sheet because the score sheet is, is really important. Um, some of you are probably going to do minor officiating throughout the year. Some of you are going to officiate a game, look at the score sheet and go, oh boy, we're in trouble. And, and then others in this clinic are coaches and mentors that are probably working with those minor officials. So jumped into a document, found a score sheet from Hoopla last year. In, and so you can see that this is pretty well done. We've got the teams listed. Uh, we've got all the players' names down first and last. Player numbers are down beside that, okay? What I want to point out, and I'm not sure how everyone's screen is, but beside those player numbers, we've got where the fouls go in. And it's really important that we have the, the period or, or quarter number in there. So the, the official way to put that in would be P1, P2, P3. But because it's very very small space a two or a three will also work and that the reason for that is when we get to bonus situation and one team says hey we don't have five team fouls yet we can take a look and, and looking at this one you could see that uh wilkie had one two three 
four fouls in the, in the fourth quarter there. Yeah. Got somebody eating chips. So we're just going to mute them. Um, and then on the, on the bottom, we're going to see that the coaches have signed off on those as well. There's a section for timeouts. And just so people are aware that the first row is, is the first half. So you can have two timeouts in the first half. The next row is there's three boxes. So you could have three timeouts in, in the uh, second half. And then the bottom ones are, are concurrent overtime periods. So you could have one timeout per overtime. So those are what those marks are for. And then we're just keeping score using the numbers and, and everything on the right-hand side. So if, if the score clock doesn't match and a team says, hey, can we, can we verify the score? We would take a look at the score here and we see 63 to 60. And we would look up and it's 63 to 59. We can adjust the score because the score sheet is official. Um, yeah, I think we, we covered everything there. So uh, the score sheet is an important document and it really stress and emphasize that we're using quarter numbers in the foul section because the team fouls up top, not a huge deal as long as we know when those fouls took place. Um, if it, person takes a technical or an unsportsmanlike that's going to go down as a T or a U in there. So we know the difference between, so P is personal foul, T is technical, and then U is unsportsmanlike. The warm-up, the warm-up changed a little bit this year and, uh, and it's, it's very different and awkward. So we used to use warm-up the opposite net to our bench. So if we take a look at the diagram on the, on the right there, we've got the court. And so the home team is going to occupy the bench to the left of the scorer's table facing the playing court. Pre-game warm-up at the basket in front of their bench. So if uh, team A is to the left of the scorer's table, they're going to warm up right in front of their bench, where we used to always warm up the opposite end. However, if both teams agree, benches or baskets can be changed. So you got you're on your home court and your the home team is always on the right hand side. You and the visiting team could, could agree to that. So officials, you're going to play a role in kind of ensuring that teams are warming up on their right net, the net in front of their bench. Um, warm up is going to consist of 20 minutes in the FIBA rule book, but typically um, if it's the only game that day, there might be longer. Or if you have back to back games, usually 15 minutes is going to be put up between games. Once the teams have cleared, cleared the floor, please be reminded that junior and or tournaments, the warm-up may vary. Might be five minutes, 10 minutes. <clears throat> so the horn's going to be sounded at uh, the following time. So at the three-minute mark, there's going to be a horn that kind of gives people a warning that warm-up is coming to an end. And then buzzed again at 1.30. And then at the 30-second mark, we want to buzz, stop the clock, and put our 10 minutes up on the clock and get the clock ready to go. So the game, um, the game again may vary in tournaments or, or anything else that you may be involved in, but a typical high school game is going to be 10 minute quarters. We're going to have four of those. A time, time is going to be stopped when the whistle sounds. So it's not straight time. And we're going to have some breaks in that, in that game. So two minutes between the first and second quarter, we're going to have 10 minutes at the half. And we kind of, the whistle goes at half, as long as nothing's going on. If there's no, you know, last minute free throws with 0.1 seconds left or anything, we're going to get 10 minutes on the clock and start it. We're going to go the same process with our buzzer sounds, three, one thirty, and 30. And then we're going to have two minutes between the third and fourth quarter. So this is an important part here. And it comes up a couple of times throughout the, the presentation is the last two minutes of the fourth quarter. So the, the basket, if a basket is scored with two minutes or less, the clock is going to stop. If a basket goes in at 2.05, the clock will continue to go and the team will gather the ball and inbound from their end line. So it has, it only stop once we're below two minutes. Uh, if we hit overtime, uh, we're going to have a two minute break between each overtime period. And then we'll, we'll, uh, go into a five minute overtime period, shoot on the same net, and the fouls are going to carry over. I uh, just want to let 
Tessa know that I'm, I do not see the chat. So if there is anything that you want to just jump in and, and we can answer questions, otherwise I think Tessa is going to continue to monitor chat and try to answer those. I just see the notifications. <clears throat> Next slide. Here we go. Um, so the game and uh, throw in. So we've got a live ball. The ball is live. We've kind of got two things in basketball, a live ball and a dead ball. So the ball leaves the hands of the official on the jump ball. The ball is now live. A free throw shooter has control of the ball, or we are throwing the ball in, and the player now has it. So that's a live ball. And then obviously while the game is going, the ball is, is live. So a dead ball is when a, a basket is made, whistle blown by official, or horn sounds for shot clock or end of the quarter. Officials, when you get the ball on, say, the sidelines for a throw-in, we're going to take a few steps. We want to be about two meters from that player, and you're going to bounce the ball to the inbounder. <clears throat> um, if we're on the end line in the front court, uh, you're going to whistle and bounce the ball to that player. The player's then going to have five seconds to get that ball into the court. We used to do a visible count, and we don't do that anymore. So you've whistled, you bounce the ball, you got your hand in the air, ready to chop time. And um, <clears throat> we're counting five seconds in our head. So defensive players must remain on the court. We can't be leaning over. We can't be trying to hit the ball out of the inbounder's hand. And then a question that comes up often is, is can a person who's inbounding the ball, can they, can they move? And so after a made basket, you can move on the end line you're trying to get that ball in you can move you can baseball throw whatever you need to do at an out of bounds spot where where we're stationary um the inbounder can move laterally within one meter so you really you really can't move um you can't grab ball on a sideline and start running down but you can take a step one way or another you kind of have one meter lateral <clears throat> So the next thing we're getting into is the opening jump ball, which is, which is fun. So lots of you probably watch the NBA. We only have one jump ball in a game. And the rest are going to be held balls and alternated possessions. So we start with that, uh, that jump ball in the middle. And Jeff, we're gonna I'm have... just going yep. to pop in here. Uh, Val asked the question, does the defender have to give space to the inbound passer? Um, usually that is dependent on the actual gym. Yep. Um, so you may want to check with the coach, the hosting coach to find out any specific rules and decide as the officials, whether space is needed. For example, if the sideline was right against or very close to the wall, um, you may choose to have defenders um, have to take a step back because there isn't space on the sideline. So that's dependent on the facility. Great, great answer. Yeah. So it's a one meter. We're looking for one meter between. And so uh, in Mushta, it's central, the stage is right against the end line. So we kind of identify a line on the floor. And I know in lots of gyms, probably with folks that are here, you might have chairs on the sideline and they're, they're touching the court almost. Last year in St. Brew at Hoopla, I think the, the fans were even on the court. So yeah, we're trying to find that gap to make sure there's one meter. So jumping back to the, the jump ball, we're going to have uh, opponents. We're going to have two people Two opponents that are going to do the jump ball. Everybody else is going to be outside of the circle. The odd gym redid theirs in the last 10 years, and they got rid of the circle, kind of make an imaginary plane where everybody's out far enough. Uh, jumpers are going to stand with both feet nearest to their own basket, so you can't, like, straddle the center line and try and get into the other person's lane. Um, a, a, you can't win a jump ball to yourself. So the, the opening jump, you the max a person can hit it is twice. And uh, it needs to go to a teammate or the opposing team. The, the jumpers can't win it to themselves unless both jumpers tap tap. But anyways, we'll just keep it simple that we don't want to win it to ourselves. If you are doing the opening jump, we want to throw it to the height of where the jumpers can't reach. We don't want it to touch the roof. So they want to kind of read your release, go in the air, and it's going up and we're getting a play right off. If you were reffing with two officials and uh, this happened on Sunday, my, my partner threw it up and it went backwards behind him. 
So I was the one not throwing. I had to whistle it down and we redid the jump ball. Um, so if the partner throws it to the roof, we're going to have to redo that one. The next thing we see a lot of is, is jump ball. And everybody yells, jump ball, jump ball, which is all good. That, that terminology is fine. So it's actually a held ball when myself and the other opponent both have the ball and we're trying to get it away. And so give an opportunity for a person to say, you know, rip the ball away. But we also don't want to get to the point where, where we could have prevented um, some aggressive play or somebody getting angry. So you can whistle that. So you're going to stop the clock, open hand, whistle jump ball or held ball. And then we're going to go with what we call alternating possession. So the, all, the possession begins on that opening jump. Team red wins the jump ball. So the next alternating possession is going to go to team white. And so every time we have alternating possessions, you know, back and forth. And then coming out of each quarter now, quarter two, three, and four, and overtime, we would then pay attention to whose possession it's going to be, and it's going to be alternating. So if you're new, a couple things you can do as a cheat. People wear elastics on their wrist, and they alternate the elastic. Uh, people put a coin in their pocket. Some people have really good minor officials, and they put it on the clock. And others, eventually, the more games you do, you can, you can remember whose possession it is. And if all else fails, sell it. And don't forget the next one. <clears throat> so timeouts. Timeouts are really important. So this is for the officials to know and the teams that are here. So we got five per team. We can use two in the first half and then three in the second. But if you don't use any timeouts and we're into the last two minutes of the fourth quarter, you're going to lose one of those. So that's okay. So you can only use two timeouts in the last two minutes. If we end up in overtime, you're going to be given one more timeout per overtime period. You cannot carry any of these over. So sometimes people are like, hey, I carried mine over from the first half. No, you didn't. You, you left those ones in the first half. So timeout 60 seconds in length, and we need a horn at 50. Uh, or a whistle. So as officials, if you, if you don't have it up on the clock, you want to make sure that we're getting the teams in. Both officials are going to split. We're going to one go to each bench and we'll say, all right, here we go. It's white ball, wherever it's going to be. Um, the head coach or the first assistant may request a timeout at the scorer's table. And then that's going to come at the next stoppage in play or after an opponent scores. So the final two minutes, um, <clears throat> This is where things get a little bit tricky. If, you, if you're new to basketball or just coming back to basketball after a lot of years. So you call a timeout in the last two minutes. You used to Jeff, automatically. I'm gonna, oh, yeah. Jeff, I'm going to hop in. Sorry, this isn't a question, but I just wanted to um, expand on the head coach or first assistant may request a timeout at the scorer's table. So once that request is made at the scorer's table, if they don't cancel that request, it's the scorer table's job to buzz that timeout. Yeah. Okay. Um, we actually had it come up at Hoopla here in Winyard, where the coach is like, um, well, I now, now I didn't want my timeout, but you didn't cancel it with the scorer's table. So once you request it at the scorer's table, it can be buzzed in um, because that's where the request goes and not actually to the official. Can a player captain call a timeout? No, they cannot. Nope. And the other thing, I think a lot of people probably on this, on this, um, session watch the nba and the players are falling to the ground and calling timeouts and it's live play timeouts we don't have that so it's only dead ball or after a made basket um so moving on to the last two minutes so we're going to take a timeout you, your team just got scored on coaches request the timeout everybody's going to go do their timeout at the conclusion of that timeout officials are going to go over and say hey coach where do you want the ball and so you have two options. You can take it on your end line. So if you take it in the backcourt, you're going to have 24 seconds on the shot clock. If you advance the ball, we're going to have 14 seconds on the shot clock. And once that decision is made, it is final. So if you go and ask that coach, we're going to advance the ball, and now the other team takes a timeout, which is allowed, uh, the ball is still going to be advanced, okay? So it's where, where that decision is made. <clears throat> um, and then if we advance the ball, we want to do at the, at the throw-in line opposite the scorer's table. So 
99.9% of the gyms in the province don't have a throw-in line. So what you want to identify is like the top of the three-point line opposite scorers table. And let's say take a, take a meter over from there. That would be your throw-in line. Okay, so it's not at half. And then that throw-in has to be in the front court. <clears throat> substitutions. Um, so we, we, we have lots of substitutions. There's no limit to them. We just got to ensure that they are reporting to the table and uh, asking for a sub. In certain gyms, I know they should say every sub should be next to the table waiting, but there are certain gyms where it's easier to have one person kind of there and know that multiples are, are going to sub. Uh, we're just looking for efficiency with that. So uh, both teams after a successful last free throw. So that's saying if both teams are asking for subs uh, or, or one or the other and a free throw, the last free throw is made, we can sub then. And then uh, the non-scoring team. So my team got scored at on and there's a minute 56 left on the clock in the fourth quarter. The sub could come in because it's a, it's a dead ball, but the scoring team would not get a substitution there. Um, so substitutions can occur before and after a timeout. Uh, they just should be requested at the scorers table and the official is going to grant that. So yeah, yeah. Subs good. Come on in. So we are subs and beckon them in. <clears throat> so we're going to get into some, some violations and what I've done here is I've highlighted, uh, a few of them. Uh, but before we do that, I think it's time for our first poll. So we're going to do question one here, and I'm just going to launch, and I'll wait about um, maybe 30 seconds and give everyone a chance to participate. So hoping that shows up on your end. So A1 is holding the ball and then falls to the playing court. A1 slides and rolls before passing the ball to A2. Is this a legal play? So give everybody a few seconds to answer that and, and I'll give everyone the answer. We'll kind of do 45 seconds per question. So if you, if you miss out on the odd one, my apologies, you'll still get the answer. I'm going to share the just in a pause here, when does the coach have to declare where they want to throw the ball in? After the timeout. However, lots will try to declare it right away. They'll say, oh, we're advanced, we're advancing it. But it's actually after the timeout. You're talking in the last two minutes, I, I'm assuming? Yes. Yeah, so after the timeout. Thank you. <clears throat> and so uh, with 84% of the vote, you are correct. So the only thing that's wrong here is the roll. So when player falls to the court, slides and rolls before passing the ball to A2. So you can fall, you can slide with that. And we're going to get into some of that with our, with our violations here. So thanks for taking part in that one. Uh, I've got four more. Hopefully I remember to put those ones on. Um, so a couple of violations that I didn't make slides on because I thought we'd just quickly touch on. So a player or ball goes out of bounds. So I pass to my teammate, goes right through their hands, hits the end wall. That's a violation. No fouls, no, no harm. We're just going the other way. So we're going to stop the clock, open, open hand, and point to direction, white ball. Uh, closely guarded player. And the reason, again, I didn't make a slide on this one because you don't see it called that much, especially with the speed of the game nowadays. So closely guarded player is when we've got uh, a player not moving for longer than five seconds. So where we may see something like this in the modern game is in the last few 20, 30 seconds, ball gets inbounded to a player and they just take it and they, they hug the ball. And so you, you as an official would start counting five seconds. And if they get to five seconds, we're going to have to whistle that as, as a closely guarded. So when I say that, I assume that a defender is going to be right near that person. So closely guarded. Um, and then obviously we're going to get into some different situations with fouls and, and those kind of things. And then a football, um, or a kickball, lots of confusion with this. So if I pass the ball to Tessa and on the way through that key, it was a bounce pass. Somebody sticks their foot out and kicks it and ends up in the stands. We've got a kickball. 
That's not a foul. We just have kickball onto the end line. If the shot clock is less than 14 seconds, we are going to reset it to 14. If I try to make a bounce pass to Tessa and we've got Ken, our official's rep, standing in the key in his cylinder with his hands up and it hits his leg or hits his foot, but he doesn't even move, it's not a football. So the football is intentionally um, making a play at the ball with our foot. Now, sometimes somebody's jumping and they're in the air and their foot hits it. That's probably, that would be a football. So don't, don't give too much leniency there, but it's an intentional play with that foot. So we'll get into a few violations. I tried to balance the slides between what people might have uh, many thoughts and questions on and one that's a little more straightforward. So dribbling. The, the modern game of basketball has changed from what it used to be. It used to be very up, down, up, down. We see lots of movement, left, right, lateral. Um, so what we want to pay attention to is I have ball. I now put ball down. We've started dribbling. That's the simplest part of that. Um, and then what we want to be watching for is now what we're doing with our hands. And so it, it gets difficult because players are fast and, and they're moving quick and, and your angles are weird, but a player can't put their hand under the ball and change direction of it. So I'm dribbling. Now I've got it here and I start going this way and, and I've moved with the ball, but the ball isn't on the ground. So we could have a double dribble or a carry. So both signals are there. Again, we're open hand, double dribble or carry. Okay. Uh, the dribbling ends when a player touches the ball with both hands or it comes to rest. So we will see, depending on some of you that are going to do some officiating at the, the lower levels, junior levels, brand new kids, they'll start dribbling with two hands. We can't run down the court dribbling with two hands. Um, and, and they'll also, they will, they will actually catch the ball and then start dribbling again because it's, it's a bit of a panic for new, new kids playing basketball. So you just calmly whistle double dribble, going the other way. Now, this is another one we, we get dealing with this a lot more at the, the high school level is three in the key. If you are refing grade seven and eight kids, you want to try and use your voice and say, hey, number three, get out of the key. Because a lot of times they're not running a set offense and that kid probably has nothing to do with the play for that moment unless they get the ball. And there's a lot of confusion out there. The high school level, we've got set offenses. And let's say a post play post is going to go down in the key established position, try to get open. We're going to allow that to happen. Don't start going one, two, three, and trying to call that over call that. Um, so we give some allowances for players that are attempting to leave. So um, they're heading in there. They post up ball doesn't come in. They get a chance to get out. They haven't impacted the play at all. Um, or if a teammate is in the act of shooting. So if they're in there and all of a sudden a teammate shoots the ball, don't, don't whistle three in the key because the ball's already, already gone. The biggest thing here, and, and you'll hear it lots if you play at the high school level or, or if you coach, is you'll hear communication of, number three, get out. You know, you've kind of in your head hit that. I've hit my three-second window. You haven't, the ball hasn't come to you. You haven't done anything. Let's give you a chance to get out of this. If they don't, we're going to whistle that. And then communicate, you know, lots of times at, uh, at free throws is when I'll just go over to a player and say, Hey, you know, you're in the key way too long. Or when I, when you hear me say, get out, I'm talking to you, let's make that happen. And then both feet must clear the key. Uh, a little strange one with that is, is a player could, you can't be in the key and then go out on the end line and come back in right back into the key. Cause you haven't actually cleared the key. So they need to exit the key and then enter back in. And I'm using the common terminology. If you look in the rule book, there might be some different terminology than I'm using. Traveling. And, and so this was one where I struggled to, to develop this slide because I know there's so many questions and so, so much misunderstanding with traveling because it, it's a hard one to see. And it changed a few years ago to allow a control one, two motion. So the first thing we want to know about ball is we can establish a pivot foot. But once that pivot foot is established, it needs to remain as that pivot foot. So I've person has passed me the ball and I start with my right foot on the ground. I move my left one. 
My right foot is now my pivot foot. And I can, I can twist and turn. But what we'll also see, which might cause a traveling violation, is that pivot foot starts six feet outside of the key. And we're pivoting a little bit. Next thing you know, we're in the key and we haven't dribbled. Well, how did you move six feet without dribbling? We probably have a travel there. The other one is people will switch their pivot feet. Um, they might scissor step. They might be moving around. You might see someone catch the ball and, and I, I call it happy feet. They start dancing. That's also a travel. Uh, so to begin the dribble, we want ball released from our hands before lifting the pivot foot. So I can't jump in the air and land and, and then start dribbling. That's, that's a travel. So now we've got some players that are progressing up the floor and we're not going to catch a pass in a stationary motion. So we catch that pass. We now have a chance to catch it, control, and then one, two. Okay. Or we could put the ball down and then we're going to have one, two as well. Um, another thing is with, uh, I, I can't remember where I put it. Oh, right there. Yeah. So if I start with a, uh, and I jump off my right foot, I can't land on my right foot. So I, I need to, if I release off my right, I need to land on with my opposite foot or that becomes a travel as well. And then this is the first poll that we did and uh, everybody did a really good job. But the last part I kind of bolded there is when people are on the ground, they get the ball and they stand up. So we can't stand up when we're on the ground. We can, we can pass, we can do what we need to do, but you can't get ball be on the ground and stand up. So that happens, I probably see that 20 times, 20 times a year. A uh, person could begin a dribble on the ground and then stand themselves up if they still have a dribble. I do see any, any questions coming in about travels there, Tessa, that you want to jump in on? Um, can they have control one, two, and then pass? Or does it have to be a layup with a shot? Uh, no, as long as balls balls released. So yeah, you you get a pass like even when you're coming to a complete stop. There, I'm not sure if I can go back. When we come to a complete stop, we're we're gonna get two steps uh, because it's it's a fast game. There's no way a person could just stop. Um, so you, you would as long as you're releasing that ball. Uh, another one is is kind of that jump stop, and I didn't really touch on that. But a jump stop is where we've caught ball. We come down or we come down on two feet. And so we would, we would then uh, be able to make a move with that. Uh, but if you catch ball and you have both feet on the ground, you can decide what pivot foot you're going to go with. So eight seconds and, and back and over, I think, are, are good ones to have on the same slide. So you're going to have eight seconds to get the ball from your back court to the front court. That's the simplest way to put it. Basket is scored on you. You inbound the ball. We now need to get that ball over to the front court in eight seconds. Uh, if any of you are minor officiating this year or you're refing, we want to make sure that the shot clock is held until the ball is inbound and that player gets the ball. So lots of times as officials, we don't, we used to do a visible one, two, three to eight count. And now we are supposed to, when we see 15 on the shot clock, whistle it. But I struggle to whistle it at 15 if my shot clock operator forgets to reset it and they get the ball with 20. So we want to hold that. We want to reset it once the ball is in and caught. Um, so we have eight seconds. And, uh, and then once we're into the front court, and so into the front court means three points of contact. So left foot, right foot, ball. Um, or you've passed it over the front court into somebody that is already established. Okay. Uh, if the ball is, you're being checked, you're being pressed, and that defender knocks the ball out and we have four seconds off the shot clock so we whistle tweet out of bounds you now have four seconds to get it over and there should be 20 seconds on the shot clock uh in a jump ball situation we can also have uh situations where we have um less than our eight and we have an inbound it so ball ball return to the backcourt um we lose the ball i pass it to my player they miss it rolls to the backcourt if a defender's running up the court and are going to be the first ones to pick it up, you, you wouldn't whistle it. So we would wait till that offensive team actually touches ball and we would tweet back and over. Okay. Or over and back. Um, 
and or we pass it to a teammate and their their feet are on the line so the line is back and over it doesn't have your foot doesn't have to go over that line when we see someone hit the line that is back and over <clears throat> So we're getting into our shot clock and, and I tried to put a, some information here. Feel free to uh, take a screenshot of this one if you need. And so we have 24 seconds on the clock after a basket is scored. Um, in, in the SHSA on an offensive rebound, we're going to get 24 seconds. And so that's, that's an amendment because not all our gyms have the quick button to go 14. Or if there's a foul in the backcourt. So... Uh, we got a team pressing. I'm trying to dribble up. I get fouled. There's 19 seconds on the shot clock. We administer the foul and then reset the clock. Um, and then uh, we've got some expiration of the shot clock and basket made. And so the shot clock goes off. I shoot the ball and the shot clock goes off. Don't whistle until we see what happens because that ball can go in and then we wouldn't whistle. If it doesn't touch the rim, we need to blow it dead. And then 14 seconds occurs if we have a foul in the front court. So my team's on offense. We get fouled. It's non-shooting. And there was only three seconds left on the shot. We're going to go inbound the ball on the end line and put 14 seconds up. And then we already talked about this last one is, um, sorry, um, backcourt turnover. So if I turn the ball over in my backcourt, so I've inbounded the ball. Tessa's trying to run it up to get it into, into the front court and loses, it goes out of bounds. So the other team's going to come over, get that ball in the front court with 14 seconds. And then we talked about the advancement in the last. So I'm just trying to prioritize here a little. <clears throat> uh, and then this is, this is one that uh, we, we often see and we got a lot of questions about. So basket interference. So I ref a lot of high school stuff. So what happens when a player jumps and slaps the backboard? And this happens all the time. It happened last night, but the ball went in. And everybody's looking at you. He can't do that. Well, well, it didn't affect anything. The ball went in. So as an official, we need to determine if the ball had a, had a chance to enter. Did the vibration cause the ball not to enter the basket? So if I, what I always kind of look for is, is if that ball has a good chance of going in, person slaps the backboard, we're going to whistle it called basket interference used to score it i probably will still use that signal and then we're going to score the basket and it's not a foul we're just scoring the basket the team that just got scored on is going to have the ball okay um and then if somebody reaches through the bottom so it's coming through the mesh and somebody jumps up and like punches it or hits it out it's also basket interference tweet score the hoop give the ball in and uh and go and then the one that I, I see, because I think we will have lots of you that are interested in fishing, you'll be doing some of the younger age stuff. And I've, I've had this at high school. So red team scores on their own basket. Oh boy. Guess what happens next? The other team goes and they, they try to inbound it. And now the whole place is confused. So all of a sudden everybody's confused. So what I generally do, and this is just a personal preference that when I, I refed, used to ref 40 or 50 elementary games a year, I would just whistle it. Score the basket on for the other team, even because you just scored on your own net and uh, get everybody going in the right direction again. Because they, they will. If you score on your own net, the other team will grab the ball and they're starting to go the wrong way and everybody's confused. Nobody knows who the points are for. So that happens. And uh, I think it's time for... Question number two. So we're ready for question number two. Here we go. Are both head coach A and first assistant coach A permitted to remain standing at the same time in the team A bench area? So I'll have to go a little bit quicker on here as we're getting near the end of our time. <clears throat> All right, I am going to three, two, one, and pull, share the results. And so 82% of our, our people here are correct. No, only one coach is allowed to stand at a time. 
And that happened about five, six, seven years ago. Just needed a little bit less going on. A coach can get up, walk to the end of the bench, sit down, talk to a player. That's okay. But we can't have all the coaches standing, yelling, giving directions. It, it just creates chaos. So great work on that one. <clears throat> um, and so we're going to move on from that. So we're getting into some fouls now. And I think we're going to end up with some questions as we get into this section. And I look forward to those. So fouls, infraction of the rules concerning legal contact, okay? And so there can be different team fouls and personal fouls and technicals and unsportsmanlikes and disqualifying. So the one we see most is a personal foul. A player is playing hard, they're defending, whatever happens, and they get a foul, okay? So a player makes legal contact, whether we're, we're live ball or dead. <clears throat> so players cannot hold, block, push, charge, trip, impede. So whatever they're trying to do, um, one thing I do, I do always use this reference is uh, basketball is a non-contact contact sport. And so it's, it's non-contact, whereas like hockey, your body checking someone into the boards. We don't, we don't do that, but we're constantly established against another position. So <clears throat> just be aware of, of those. And then every player may receive five personal fouls. So last night I overheard this kid say to himself, all right, I burnt my two freebies. I got one more freebie. I got to be careful on the fourth. And I just kind of laughed to myself. I'm like, interesting way to look at it. Uh, they scored <clears throat> on both of the, the shooting fouls. Uh, and then we would have a player fouled out if they received five fouls. So if they're just personal fouls or they're common fouls, there's no suspension, no, no nothing. They're just fouled out onto the bench, substitution from the bench. So an important concept to understand, and, and there's, if you look in the rule book, there's like 15 pages just on this. Uh, we've got an hour to go through everything. So our, our cylinder principle and our principle of, of verticality. So you as a player are, are entitled to your cylinder. You, if there's an open cylinder on the court, you can occupy that. And, and you can be in your principle of ver verticality, okay? So I can be here because you're not there. And, and what that means is like when a defender is in position, an offensive player comes through that key and drops the shoulder into that defender. The defender was entitled to that space on the court. And that's why we may have an offensive charge. Okay. So that's what that means. As defenders, you're in your cylinder, you're allowed to jump all, you know, and occupy that space. But what we often see is I'm coming in as a shot. You'll jump, you'll karate chop. And then you stand there like this and say, what did I do? And so it's very obvious to everyone else what happened, um, but you're, you're entitled to your cylinder, okay? So you can play that tall D. Uh, once we start leaning in, okay, you're outside of you, your cylinder. But the offensive player isn't, isn't allowed to over-engage in your cylinder ever. Or, or also, sorry. So it's, it's a bit of a balance between the O and the D, and, and we don't – we won't want to give credit to the O because they have the basketball. So everybody's entitled to those cylinders. And then you're trying to find a balance between that. Okay. Uh, and that's where you're watching for those holds, push, shove, uh, arm bars as somebody's trying to go by. <clears throat> so a few of the common fouls, and, and I just put these all into one slide for, for those that are refing, we, we're going to call a foul with a closed fist. So it's going to go in the air, closed fist. And then it's got to proceed with something like what happened. And so did the player get pushed? Were they held? What, whatever might have happened. Um, and you can kind of determine with, the, with your signal. So a lot of times it's illegal use of the hands, illegal contact. So somebody went for the ball, they got them on the arm, we're just going to foul, legal contact or whatever. Um, and then lots of other fouls are often Push. So I kind of went with the five more common signals there just to give everybody a reference. So the 50-50 the call, uh, that's what we call this in, in basketball, is the 50-50, the, the, the block charge. So first off, we'll start with, with the screen. So in basketball, we, we set a screen and we need to be stationary as an offensive player when I'm setting a screen. I can't be leaning. I can't be running. I can't put my arms out to try and stop somebody from going by me. That's an illegal screen or a block. Okay. On defense now, <clears throat> you're entitled to your cylinder. 
But if you're in bad position and the offensive player is going around you and you stick out your leg to try and stop them or you create that contact, we're going to have what we call a block. Okay. If your feet are moving and you're going in all different directions and you create that contact as a defender, block. So fist goes in the air and block at the hips. Okay. Um, so it's illegal to extend arms, elbows outside of the cylinder. One thing you'll see lots in the, the transition play is what I call the arm bars. Called it last night. Offensive player gets the angle and the defensive player sticks out the arm and the offense player is all of a sudden impeded by that arm bar. Okay, we've got a block for the arm bar. Now charging. This is where things get a little bit complicated because everyone's angle is in favor of their team. Okay, so we're going to see have the defending team thinks their, their player is perfectly set, hasn't moved, and the offensive team, of course, uh, doesn't think their player did anything wrong. So you, you commit to the call, you, you, you kind of watch, and the biggest thing with the block charge is tr learning to anticipate. So those that are in this clinic that are players, if you're heading through the key and there's three people in there and you decide I'm going to drop my shoulder and hope I get a foul call, it's, it's not going to go in your favor that often because it's very obvious to an official when there's three established people in their cylinder and you decided you wanted to do the NBA drop your shoulder and go thing. Um, pay attention to offensive players pushing with the basketball to create space. Okay, that can be a charge. So you are pushing somebody away and then trying to do a fadeaway shot could be called a charge. Um, and then another one is when an offensive player kind of, it's not a charge be a hold, but they are trying to throw you out of the way as a defender to gain that position. Uh, that would be also illegal offensive play. Um, but in the end, uh, it's, it's a very difficult call. Things happen at fast paces in, in basketball. We want to watch the, the defender's feet. Are they, are they stationary? Are they in good position? Are they vertical? If they're sticking their arms out, you know, they can't do those things. And then with the offensive player, try and get in an angle to be able to see who's creating the contact and, uh, and who's at fault. Just checking our time. <clears throat> so we're going to do a poll right after this one. So technical foul, I really wanted to get into technical foul because it's changed. Okay. It's changed over the years. And, and essentially what it is, is a non-contact foul. So I, a person swears they're disrespectful to an official. They're challenging. They're screaming and yelling at another player, um, and you call a tech. So you're gonna you're gonna whistle tech, and then we're gonna have one shot, and then we're gonna go back to whatever we were doing. Okay. So it used to be one shot in possession, and people are still calling that in per places in the province. It's not a technical foul. Is one shot back to what we were doing. So if if somebody. Um, is shooting two free throws and their own team takes a tech. One person's going to shoot the tee. We're going to go right back to those free throws. If a player receives two technicals in a game, they will be ejected from that game or a combination of one technical and one on sports like ejected from that game. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do here, I'm going to jump into our next poll question and let's, uh Oh, Let's get it launched here. <clears throat> so dribbler A1 is charged with a technical foul. Player B6, so the opposite team, requests to enter the game to attempt the free throw. Is this permitted? So you have about 30 seconds for that. All right. Sorry if you didn't get a chance here. I'm just going to end that. I'm going to share the results. And with 40% of the vote, it is yes. So they, they are permitted to come on the floor. So they're doing their substitution, which would occur prior to the technical foul. And now the officials say, we've got a technical foul. Who's shooting the shot? And so it would need to be one of the five that are now on the court. And so if you're wondering... 
Did I get that one wrong on the exam? I did not, but thanks. <clears throat> okay, uh, so we're getting into unsportsmanlike fouls. We're going to kind of get to the end of our, our clinic with unsportsmanlike fouls. So this is a contact foul. This is a hard foul. Jeff, uh, just wanted oh, yeah. Jeff, um, the difference in signal in a technical versus a timeout. Yeah, it's not much. So we've got timeout a single finger on top. And we're then pointing to the bench of whoever took that. And then we're going to have full hand. I'm not sure if people can see me or not. So you're going to have full hand for the tech. Uh, don't, sometimes you like get your mat as an official and you over tech and you kind of like break your own finger. So just be aware of that. Uh, but yeah, it's full hand versus single finger and, uh, and then stop play versus foul. Um, <clears throat> so unsportsmanlike foul, things have changed the last few years and changed again this year. So an unsportsmanlike foul could be uh, a hard push, not trying to play the ball, and you just blast someone into the end, end wall. That can be an unsportsmanlike foul. Could, could even be a disqualifying foul, but for the purpose of this. Um, but the biggest thing we, we saw change in the unsportsmanlike foul is in the last two minutes, you're down by six, and you're trying to foul to stop the clock. We need to watch as officials for a legitimate attempt to play the ball where it used to be. I'm just, are you guys fouling? Yes. And you put a hand on someone's shoulder and you call a foul. It's not like that anymore. So the ball is going to be inbounded. That defensive team is going to probably try to do a trap, whatever they're going to do first. And then they're, they're likely then going to try and foul if they can't get the ball right away. So that foul needs to be an attempt to play the ball. Um, anything that looks like an attempt to play the ball, personal foul, common foul, all good. But if it's like a grab arm, pull jersey, push, it's an unsportsmanlike. So that's not a legitimate attempt to play the ball. And so what will happen with an unsportsmanlike foul is a few things. So if it's, an, if it's like that, we're going to shoot two, and that team's going to get possession again in the front court. Okay? Um, and then they would have 14 on the shot. But – the, uh, the other times that we might have some unsportsman likes or, or a non-shooting foul, so we're going to have two shots possession. If, I shoot, if I'm shooting and I get pushed hard from behind, but I make the basket, I'm going to get one shot plus possession. And then if it's a shooting foul, either you're going to get two or three shots, depending on where it was on the court, plus possession. And as mentioned on the last slide, two unsportsman likes equals a, a game ejection or a combination of one tech, one U. So again, with this, and, and we, could, we could talk about this for a half hour, but we don't have a half hour. So biggest thing is contact foul. And the teams that are here make a legit play at the ball. Even if that play is coming around someone, hitting the arm while you're trying to play a ball, that's okay. Just try and play the ball. Don't just grab someone's jersey, shoulder, whatever we used to do. Uh, I'm going to go back in. I've got one more poll question here. And uh, this is an important one I skipped. I didn't make a slide of it, so I put a poll instead. So we've got assistant coach A enters the court to attend injured A1. A1 is ready to resume play within 15 seconds. Must A1 be substituted? So instead of doing an injury player slide, I went with a poll. and We'll talk about the answer to this. Pretty balanced. All right, I'm going to end the poll. Sorry if you didn't get a chance to. You'll know the answer you had in your head. And I'll share the results. Um, so, yes. Yes, the player needs to be substituted. So, an injured player. So, we've got a couple things. So, if the player is injured and they're not in the play, so then there's a fast break going on, we can let the fast break continue unless the player looks seriously injured and the reason for that is we we don't want a player to fake an injury so that we whistle down a fast break or an open open layup okay if they're injured in the key we're going to whistle it dead because we don't want that player to get additionally injured now an injured player has 15 seconds to determine if they are good to continue or not but if a coach 
or a trainer or anybody else comes out to assist them, they now have to come off the court. Okay, so they have 15 seconds as an official. We will never get involved with an injured player. Uh, let, the, let the coaches, trainers, those that are, that are there to do that. Uh, so they, they come on the court right away. That player needs to come off for one tick of the clock and then could, could uh, request a substitution. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so then we've got some team fouls and kind of fly through this last part. But when team reaches five fouls in a quarter, the opposition is now going to be shooting free throws for remainder of the quarter. Be aware um, <clears throat> that offensive fouls will not be shooting penalty. Okay. So if my team has five fouls, I come down, drop the shoulder, get called for a charge. Possession is now just going to go to the other team. Okay. So we're not, we're not shooting on, uh, on those. And uh, we're going to finish off with one last question. Cause I think we have time, even though we're a couple minutes past. Um, Here we go. Let's see if everyone can get this one right. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna end the poll, and we'll share the results. And so the final answer there is no. So with 61% of the vote, no. Um, we've kind of hit our one hour limit, and and so those that are really interested in fishing, I, I wish you all the best this year. Um, this was just a basic introduction clinic for for players and, and coaches and teams. We didn't go through positioning on the court because it's very difficult to do that through Zoom. Uh, so I hope that if you do have an interest in officiating, you're able to get into a clinic and, uh, and learn some of the positioning stuff or maybe have a mentor that's willing to work with you. Uh, we'll, we'll finish up with the last couple of questions in the chat. Uh, if anything's coming up there, Tessa, and if not, I, I just want to wish you all the best basketball season. Uh, it's going to be a great year. And uh, thanks to those coaches that are here that are committing your time for your teams, the officials that are going to be working with the junior programs out there, and hopefully all the players that learned a couple things here today. Good luck this year. And I'll um, jump over to Tessa here. Is the slideshow available to be emailed? Uh, slideshow could be, uh, but we're also going to post this tomorrow on our YouTube channel. So it'll be available there. Okay, so the video will be available on the YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, is dunking in warm-up a technical foul? Dunking in warm-up is not a technical foul. Great question, though. If you dunk in warm-up at Hoopla, uh, it's called the Shane Soudan rule. It's a $100 fine because Shane Soudan dunked in warm-up in Regina in the 90s and broke the backboard. And uh, so we don't have extra gyms at Hoopla, so it's a $100 fine. Uh, what's the YouTube? You can just search SHSA on YouTube. Yep. And yep. sorry, Jeff, it's Val Gordon. Could you email this presentation though to district president?